morning everyone, good morning seniors and friends. Uh, so the topic, uh, what I will be speaking to you about is a tracheobronchial de-obstruction, when and how. So before we move to the topic proper, first we need to understand what is the central airway obstruction. So it can be a malignant process, it can be a mechanical process or any obstructive process that impedes the airflow within the central airways which we mean by trachea main stem bronchi and right main bronchus intermedius. So as I said to you before, the central airway obstruction is not always essentially because of a malignant process. It can be because of malignant like in primary tumors of the bronchus or it can be a metastatic, the most common being the breast, the colorectal or the re renal malignancies or it can be because of an extrinsic compression of the airway or a direct invasion from the adjoining structure like for the lymphoma or some other tumor in the mediastinum. But what we see most common is not always malignant, it is non-malignant and the most common non-malignant post-COVID what we are seeing is post-intubation or the post-tracheal tracheostomy tracheal stenosis. In addition to this you can have multitude of other causes like a TB presenting as lymphadenitis and causing a stenosis or it can be an inflammatory process like a sarcoidosis or vaginus. It can be in the form of a vascular rings or it can be in the form of a granulation tissue which is unfortunately the most common in an Indian scenario secondary to endotracheal tubes and poor tracheostomy care. In addition to this, you can have pseudotumors, you can have a hyperdynamic which is in the form of either a tracheomalacia or an excessive past membrane collapse or it can be idiopathic and in India most of these idiopathic inadvertently turns out to be tuberculosis in the end. So we divide the central airway obstruction primarily for the interventional point of view into three major divisions. One, a tumor which is purely intrinsic and a tumor which is purely extrinsic and a mixed component where there is a component of an intramural and an extramural component as well. So the major question that always crops up in your mind, should all cases of central airway obstruction be de-obstructed? Initially people believe that only when the endoluminal diameter is less than 50% it contributes to significant airway obstruction. But it is always a myth. For example, for a patient who has got an advanced parenchymal disease like patient having an ILD or patient having a massive lung tumor or a patient having a COPD, he need not develop a 50% obstruction to manifest as dyspnea. So in such cases, the typical demonstration like an endoluminal diameter less than 50% remains invalid. So your dyspnea can be contributed by a multitude of causes. It can be because of your degree of obstruction. He may be cachexic, that may be contributing to his dyspnea. He may have a poor compliance of the chest and the lung and he can have a high metabolic demand and even the acuity of the onset of obstruction like a foreign body can precipitate a severe dyspnea and patient can have an associated post-obstructive atelectasis or a pneumonia and other systemic diseases as well. So before you treat a patient with a central airway obstruction, make sure you understand this dyspnea is caused by your tumor. Because once you do a tumor de-obstruction and if the patient still has a dyspnea, probably you, are, you have treated the wrong etiology for this dyspnea. So you need to look at the patient as a whole and not just look into a bronchoscopy picture and jump to the process of de-obstruction. So when we move to the treatment options that are present in the malignant central airway obstruction, apart from bronchoscopic modalities, you do have other modalities like systemic chemotherapy, radiotherapy and surgery. But the good point and the catchy point about your bronchoscopic modality is that it helps in an acute relief of the symptoms and that is what makes IP a real fantasy field for the pulmonologist. So which, so which patient do you choose? People have done a lot of studies and they found out few of the predictors for success and failure. But having, ha, having experience of few cases uh, back and I would say that none of these actually holds good. It's every patient is different and every patient you will feel that uh, it may not be fitting into the exact criteria of this predictors of success or failure. But in general when a patient has got a pure endobronchial disease or patient is having a pure extrinsic compression then probably your IP de-obstruction procedure can result in a successful maneuver. But however, if you have got a left main stem bronchus obstruction or a mucosal infiltration of the tumor or if the patient is having an ASA score greater than 3 or associated comorbidities like a renal failure or a primary lung cancer or presence of a tracheoesophageal fistula, then while you de-obstruct these tumor, you may still end up having a dismal results. So when should I intervene? So the most important thing you will intervene for de-obstruction is not seeing a de-obstruction. It's not seeing just the obstruction. It is you need to be sure that once you de-obstruct this tumor, the patient is relieved of his symptoms. It may be in the form of a dyspnea, it may be in the form of a refractive cough, or it may be in the form of a post-obstructive pneumonia. 
So primarily, uh, most of these modalities that we do are palliative in nature and you need to weigh the risk and the benefit before you do the obstruction in these patients. There is no point in deobstructing a tumor who is going to have an extensive brain meds and patient is already bedridden and where the best thing what you can offer for the patient would be a palliative or a best supportive care. So you need to choose your patients properly and especially in the early part of your uh, IP program I think that is the best thing because once you face with a negative, negative result probably your morale goes down and probably you may start restricting doing these IP procedures. So primarily it is a palliative procedure which is aimed at relieving the dyspnea or controlling hemorrhage and it acts as a bridge to a more definitive therapy like a radiation or a surgical resection. And when you have an absence of symptoms, then definitely it is not advised to intervene solely based upon your radioscopic or bronchoscopic findings. And in few of the cases of critically ill, if you are convinced that this tumor is what that is preventing the patient from getting out of the ventilator, then you can still go ahead with the deobstruction because that will help in facilitating the extubation and probably it can result in prolongation of the survival. And most of the time it is always discussed, especially between the oncologist and the pulmonologist, is it really, does it really make a difference in the patient outcome when you deobstruct these tumors? Because anyway they are going to give you with the chemotherapy and the radiotherapy. So there are few retrospective studies and few case-based series which clearly says that the outcome of the patients even with advanced cancer when they are subjected to interventional pulmonology procedures for central airway obstruction, it resulted in better immediate symptom relief which is major for a patient who is going to live for few months. So yes, it causes immediate symptom relief and it gives prolongs the time for your chemotherapy to act as well. In addition to this, there were other studies which has clearly shown that an interventional bronchoscopy with a rigid tube improves significantly the dyspnea in patients with central airway obstruction. It also allows to administer specific oncology treatment and the median survival improved above 6 months. Another important thing that you start off as an IP is, is rigid bronchoscopy really safe? So we have got one of the best registry outcomes which is an acquired registry which says that the overall complication is 3.9 percentage and it ranges between 0.9 to 11.7 percentage. But to be very honest, it entirely depends upon the skill and the backup facilities you have. So it is only for people who are really skilled, this will be the complication. But if you are not adequately trained and you jump to doing a rigid bronchoscopy, probably you can have a higher complication rate as well. And the 30 day mortality was 14.8 and as the patient was more sicker, the mortality tend to increase. And the most important risk factors that resulted in adverse consequences in patients who have undergone rigid bronchoscopy are urgent and emergency procedures, which probably you are not, you did not have a pre-planning for the procedure or you are not equipped to manage the complication when you take such patients. And when, you, when a patient has got an ASA greater than 3 or a patient who is undergoing a repeat procedure, as Sir said, like once you do a repeat stenting, then probably you are going to face with a more complication than when you are going to stent a patient the first time. And use of moderate sedation, so in our setup we generally do it most of it under general anesthesia. So that gives, the, that gives you the time and that gives you the confidence that your anesthetist is taking care of your combined airway. And when there is a presence of an endoluminal or a mixed obstruction and airway stent placement, then probably the complications are more. So whenever you see a, a tumor that is causing a central airway obstruction, First, always make sure you are doing it for providing the symptom relief and whether it is this procedure is going to change the symptom scores or not. And then identify the type of the airway stenosis, whether it is an intrinsic or it is an extrinsic or it is going to be a mixed one. And treat always the intraluminal component first prior to uh, if you are planning a stenting. And assess the residual degree of the airway stenosis and treat the residual or the neural component. So to do this, what do we really have? Now the IP is expanding leaps and bounds and we have got a lot of techniques available. So we have got the cold techniques which can be in the form of either a rigid mechanical debulking or it can be in the form of a cryotherapy or it can be in the form of an airway stenting. In addition to this we have got a hot, lot of hot therapies like a laser, electrocardiogram, and APC. In the evening workshop you will be getting hands on to do all of these things on animal models. So but the most important thing prior to starting all this is know your scope. Until and unless you know your scope, you, don't, you know what, where is the ventilating port, what are the accessories you can put inside and you are not prepared, probably you are going to end in a catastrophe. That was the exact pretext on which yesterday one entire session was dedicated for you to understand about the rigid bronchoscopic instruments that you are using. In addition to this, you have got a cryotherapy. So we all know yesterday you would have seen that the cryotherapy consists of a probe. We have two types of probe and a spray cryo and it works upon the Joule-Thompson effect. 
and all that it causes is uh, it induces the tissue ischemia. But the problem with the cryo has always been there is a tendency to bleed. So you should always have a backup either in the form of an endobronchial blocker, in the form of a Fogarty, or you can use an ARN blocker. And you need to anticipate bleeding while you touch any patient with cryo. And the cryo recanalization is something which I will be showing in the videos further. Is what something we use recently uh, in most of our cases. And we generally freeze it for a time period between 2 to 20 seconds. But 20 seconds is high time. We generally freeze it only for 3 to 5 seconds at the max. And I will show all these things while we go on to the slides. And uh, in addition to the other cold therapy for a patient who has got an extrinsic obstruction, is an airway scan placement, which I will not be dwelling upon because we are going to have an expert lecture by Dr. Rajiv Goyal sir on the same. So in addition to this, we have got um, other uh, modalities like microdebridas. These are primarily used for an ENT modalities, though there are few centers which still use these microdebridas for causing a mechanical deobstruction in airways as well. But the problem with these microdebridas is it does not have an ability to control the bleed. So when you do these microdebridas, you can still have a lot of airway bleed and you need to be mentally prepared for it. In addition to this, we have got a lot of hot therapy. These works upon the principle of either causing a hypothermia or a devitalization, coagulation, desiccation, carbonization and vaporization. So these principles are utilized either by your electrosurgical instruments or by your lasers to cause the de-obstruction. But the problem with when you use any of these hot therapies as I said before like you need to have a restraint while using these instruments. It shouldn't be like an overuse because the more uh, aggressive you are, the more chances that you may end up causing a rent or you may even cause an airway fire. So whenever you use these hot modalities, make sure you inform your anesthetist that the FiO2 should be kept less than at least 40 percentage, not more than that, to prevent an airway fire. So this is how your uh, laser looks like. Today you will be having one of the stations where you can use the lasers on the animal models to uh, see. And in addition to this, we have got uh, other modalities uh, of electrocautery which uses the cutting current or the coagulation current or even the blended current. And one most common modality that we use when we use a tracheobronchial deobstruction is the APC. This is very, very effective because it causes a superficial burn and it does not have a greater depth. Therefore, your chances of perforating the airway is less and it is generally used for attaining a uh, hemostasis. And uh, so this is APC is a form of a non-contact electrosurgery and it consists of an electrosurgical generator, it consists of an argon gas cylinder and it has got a transport, transmitting probe. But the caution to be used when you are doing an APC is when you have an open blood vessel and you do an APC, there are chances you can end up having a gas embolization as well which are reported in the literature. So you shouldn't be over zealous in using your APCs as well while controlling the bleed and make sure you clean your APCs while you are dealing with hema, uh, bleeding because sometimes your clogged APCs may fail to fire as well. I am not going into much of the technical details because I feel like most of it has been dealt yesterday. I will just take you to few of the cases which we had at our center. So this elderly gentleman was a non-smoker. He presented to us with complaints of MMRC, great food dyspnea. He was having cough and he was having a hypoxemic respiratory failure. So as you can see from the picture, you have got a right lower lobe collapse <laughs> and when we did a bronchoscopy, all that you can see is a big tumor causing the near complete obstruction of the right main bronchus. So why the point of putting this uh, case is, your core, in this case the primary indication for debulking the tumor is for prevention of a post obstructive pneumonia. And when you relieve the tumor, uh, right main bronchus of this tumor, then you can provide a better relief in the symptom in the form of a dyspnea and refractory cuff. So you should be very clear why you are touching the patient before you go for deobstruction. So as you can see from the picture, there is a complete collapse of the right lower lobe. And as you can see from the bronchoscopy, there is a big vascular tumor obstructing the near total, causing near total occlusion of the right main bronchus. But the point to be noted is when you are doing a debulking, you should always preserve the normal lung. That is why you put a Fogarty or a suction tube on the normal lung. Then what we are using right now is an electrosurgical modality, which is in the form of an electrocautery snare. The advantage of the snare is it will help in cutting as well as in coagulating at the same setting. And these are generally used for pedunculated lesions. So as you are seeing from here, we are using the electrocautery snare to cut and coagulate a portion of this tumor. So once the tumor is cut, now what we are doing is a cryo extraction of the tumor. So the cryo adheres to the water in the tissue and you remove the tissue 
end block. That is what we are doing and you, you need to make sure that while you are removing the actuation of the cryo should be on because if you leave the pedal probably the tumor will again fall back into the airway. So again what we are using is an APC which I said which is a superficial form of coagulation and once it is done since the, there is still a part of a remnant tumor what we are what we are going to do again is again we are going to use the electrocautery snare to cut this tumor and take out this remnant tumor which is present in the right main bronchus intermediates. The point to be noted in all these interventions is two things you should always make sure. One, you have your anesthetist informed what you are doing because you need to bring down the FIO2 and next thing is you need to preserve the normal lung because this lung is already gone. So in case if a blood spills into the normal lung then probably you may end up resulting in a catastrophe. So again we are using the electrocautery snare and we are cutting the portion of the tumour and again what we are doing is we are applying the cryo and through the cryo we are removing the chunk of the tumour which we have debulbed with the help of an electrocautery snare. So the cryo, the cryo helps in removing it end block but the point to be noted as said before when you use cryo always be sure you have a backup for managing the bleed. So this is how the uh, airway looks now we have uh, there, there is a patent right main bronchus and there is also a patent right middle lobe bronchus and a portion of the right lower lobe bronchus and this patient was extubated on table and discharged. So this was the tumor pieces that were extracted from this patient and the subsequently all these procedures are palliative so you need to weigh the risk and the benefit while doing these procedures. So just take, to take it to another case, uh, this, she is a 40 year old female, she did not have any comorbidities, she presented to us with complaints of breathlessness and cough for one month and as you can see from here there is a comp uh, there is a extrinsic compression which is a mediastinal mass which is causing the entire compression of the left main bronchus and there is a collapse of the left lower lobe predominantly. So in this case whenever you see a central airway tumor first you need to divide whether you are going to deal with an intrinsic tumor or it's going to be an extrinsic tumor or it's going to be mixed. So when we did the bronchoscopy we have a fair idea there is a portion of the tumor which is bulging in but it is predominantly an extrinsic tumor. There is, so therefore there is no point in going and trying to debulb this tumor, in, in that process you will be causing a rent in the airway. So what we really wanted to do in this case was we need to stent this patient. But having said that stenting such stenosis which are extremely, airways which are extremely stenosed is also a technical challenge because you will not have a, a space for your deployer to pass through. So we tried to dilate the initial stenotic part with the help of a CRE balloon dilation. This is the CRE which you saw yesterday, we are trying to open up this airway with the help of the CRE balloon dilation but such CRE balloon dilations generally fail because the extrinsic compression by the tumor is going to be so stiff that you will not be able to dilate these uh, airways. So that's what happened even this in this case, we are trying to dilate but what we ended up was we couldn't dilate the airway further. So all that we have now is we need to put a stent which has got an extremely high uh, uh, high strength to overcome the stenosis so that becomes an indication for a metallic airway because your silicon will not have the tensile strength to keep the airway open. So what we are doing now is now we are trying to put a metallic stent. Now you will be seeing like we have passed the guide wire through the stenotic segment and under the fluoroscopic guidance in the form of the C arm we are going to place the stent. So as you can see from here we are trying to push the uh, stent uh, which is a self expanding metallic stent and it is a partially covered stent. Another important thing with uh, which Rajiv sir would be the best person to say to you the, regarding the technical complications that occur in these stents. So in this case what you as you can see from here though we deployed the stent a portion of, a portion of the stent is remaining outside and the stenosis is so stiff as you can see from here we will try to manage, we will try to push the stent inwards but in that process it even jumps back into the trachea. That is because the, extra, the compression from the extrinsic uh, mass is so huge that it literally pushed the stent back into the trachea. So here is the stent that is coming, propping up into the trachea and we try to push this stent with the help of a metallic forceps back into its position but what you will see right now is just a slight manipulation almost resulted in the stent entirely coming back into the uh, trachea. So what we did was again we tried to, we are trying to push the stent with the help of the metallic forceps but I wouldn't uh, advise everybody to do this because this has to be done very carefully. If you don't do it probably your stent will erode your airway and you may end up even creating a fistula or a ma major airway bleed. So we were able to push the stent back to in its position with the help of the rigid bronchoscope 
and as you can see from here now the airway airway will be recanalized and i am able to pass my scope beyond the lesion but these procedures when you do you should always make sure that you follow the plane of the airway and you need to have a backup for controlling the bleed and you need to anticipate complications and you need to be prepared for it as you can see from here now i am pushing the stent back into the left main bronchus I am holding it with the help of the rigid. Now my stent is in place and the stent is perfectly placed. So, the, so we have another case. I will be uh, finishing with last two cases. She is a 35 year old female. She complained of breathlessness which MMRC grade 4. She complained of cough, loss of weight and loss of appetite for 3 months. And she presented to us with this CT scan which shows a big tumour which is occupying almost the lower one third of the trachea and obstructing even the carina. So when we went inside with the bronchoscopy, we were able to see a bilobe tumour which is causing almost near total occlusion of the airway. The main point which I want to stress from this video is whenever you do a bronchoscopy for a patient with central airway obstruction, even your simple bronchoscopy can change the airway into a critical airway. So you need to have a backup for uh, establishing the airway because when you manipulate such tumours it can result in edema and it can result even in near total obstruction of the airway. So this bronchoscopy was done in the ICU. So again what we are doing is since it is a polypoid mass we, we are passing the snare and through the snare as you can see from here we are cutting the uh, po portion of the tumour and once one lobe of this tumour is cut, again the principle remains that we remove it either with the help of a rigid bronchoscopy forceps or in this case we are removing it with the help of a cryo extraction. But as you can see from here I would have passed the fogati behind and a suction catheter behind because I don't want my lung to be flooded while doing this procedure. Again I am passing an electrocautery snare for the second pass to cut the remnant portions of this polypoid tumour and once it is cut again I am removing the tumour. So this, these are the Typical methods, but what really happens is when in few cases once you do an electrocautery snare you may not attain a 100% lumen. While doing this process we also have a backup with an APC and this helps us in attaining a hemostasis in the airway. So we are using these APCs to coagulate these bleeding blood vessels which are superficial. And once it is done there is still a remnant portion of the tumour so I am using a, a, and to control the bleed I am also using an adrenaline soaked gauze. This is another technique which you can use while doing your interventional pulmonary procedures or even a simple fogati can provide a mechanical tamponade and can help in controlling the bleeding and attaining hemostasis. So once it is done I am using a cold technique which is a rigid bronchoscopic uh, coring so I am trying to core out the uh, uh, remnant tumours which are there which are not snarable. So but while doing this procedure you need to be extremely cautious because a small change in your axis of uh, Coring can result in a rent in the airway and that becomes a big complication in its own. So you need and these are not to be attempted when you are trying initially. And we are also using the same cryoprobe to cause cryoablation. The change in the cryoablation is we freeze it for a longer period of time with repeated freezing and thawing with the hope that this cryoablation will kill the residual tumor cells and the chances of recurrence will be less. And I would like to take you to the one last case before I close the presentation. She is a 38 year old female who has got an SVC syndrome with a suspicion of a fibrosing mediastinum with a massive pericardial effusion and respiratory distress. So this was the uh, CT scan which was showing an extrinsic tumour. It was not a tumour looking, it was looking more like a node and it was causing almost a near total occlusion of the lower end of the trachea and even the bronchus. So this anything that causes the obstruction of the airway or within one centimetre from uh, obstruction of the carina or within one centimetre from the carina becomes a candidate for your metallic or a silicon Y stenting. So here we are doing a bronchoscopy. The point to be noted is in this case we did the procedure but post procedure even we were sceptical whether we should have really done this procedure or not. So many a times our decision changes once we do the procedure post procedure as well. So as you can see from here there is a big vascular tumour which is arising from the carina and it is highly vascular in nature. So whenever such vascular tumour is there you need to make sure while taking a biopsy or while attempting anything there can be a chance of a bleeding which may compromise both the lungs. So what we did was in this case we tried to move away from biopsying this lesion instead what we did was we used the EBUS uh, to arrive at a diagnosis so that we can plan whether it is going to be a uh, benign process or a malignant process. So we did the EBUS and we took the passes from the 
paratracheal region and it turned out to be an adenocarcinoma and this is a very rare presentation of an adenocarcinoma presenting like a fibrosing media stand in a slight picture. So then what we tried to do is we thought that okay again we will do a CRE balloon dilation to open but in most of these extrinsic compressions by the tumor invariably your CRE balloon dilatation fails. So as in this case it failed. So right now we know that we cannot do much. So what we planned was we will put a uh, self expanding metallic Y stent because there is an extrinsic compression both at the level of the lower end of the trachea and there is an involvement of the carina as well. But to put the stent you need to have a proper uh, carina. So what we are doing is we are using the electrocautery instruments. We are using a knife to debulk this tumor. This is very unusual generally we don't use a knife. But in this case we thought that we will cut the carinal mass into two pieces so that we can easily remove it. That's what we are trying to attempt with the help of an electrocautery knife. But again you need to be very careful. If you are going very deep or if you are too ambitious you may create a rent even at the level of the carina. So we tried to remove this tumor that was present in the level of the carina with the help of an electrocautery knife and we made it into a few of the smaller pieces. I don't know whether it is the right technique to do it or not but that is what was going in our mind when we were doing this procedure. And in any of these IP procedures there is never a right or wrong because while you are doing you are the only person who are going to make a decision and only at the end of the procedure maybe you can get some critical comments what you did was right or wrong. So then we are using the electrocautery uh, tip to cause the coagulation of these tumors which are present at the level of the carina and we are using the hot therapy to debulk these tissues. So once we know that now we have a carina where the stent can be adequately placed this so we have tried to debulk the tumor as much as possible without creating much of a complication in the form of a rent what we put was a self expanding metallic waste. So it all looked so rosy even for us but what really happened is once we put a self expanding metallic waste and the SVC pressure increased because there were a lot of collaterals which was going around because of the fibrosing media standards and now we are faced with a new complication when the patient started having a puffiness of the face. This, uh, this is something which we learn with experience um, because we never had this experience of stenting a patient with an SVC. So whenever you have a patient with an SVC and when you stent, probably you can have a better airway but at the cost of increasing your SVC syndrome. So we had to subject these patients for radiation therapy and any tumor that has got such extensive with pericardial effusion as well, they are going to have a limited survival and this patient succumbed after 3 months of doing any of these palliative care. So I will finish my talk here and, if the, and just one last slide, this is what you need to remember. Always you see your central airway obstruction whether it is going to be an emergent or a non-emergent and when you are doing it always you have this decision whether it is going to be a curative or it is going to be a palliative. And you make sure whether you are going to deal only with an intrinsic tumor or you are going to with the extrinsic tumor or you are going to face a mixed tumor. And when you are going to have an extrinsic tumor or a mixed tumor, make sure that you have a stent in place. And above all, when you are in trouble, your seniors are the one person who will come for your rescue and always bank on them. Thank you. Yes, excellent presentation. So, any if you want to take any questions? Vishwesh, this is Sonia. Yeah. Uh, the central airway obstruction, so how do you take care of the ventilation? You know, when you have uh, the tumor, big tumor, which is the last case, as you said, uh, how would you take care of the ventilation of that patient? So, gen generally, what we have noticed, ma'am, the ventilation isn't a much of issue in these patients, despite them having so much of a mass which is causing 90% occlusion of the airway. Till now, for most of these tumors, we never faced a ventilatory issue problem. But if a patient is have, going to have a coexisting COPD or a coexisting ILD, then probably oxygenating or ventilating this patient really becomes a difficult process. But uh, to be very honest with you, even those tumors which were bilobed, which was causing 90% obstruction, we sedated, we paralyzed, we intubated, and we were able to effectively ventilate these patients without much of complication, provided their parenchyma is not. In case if there are an associated parenchymal abnormality, then yes, we definitely face a problem. And one more problem that generally comes is when we ask the anesthetist to decrease the FiO2 to 40%, that is when you see that your saturation starts dipping. So you need to be very quick in your procedure while doing these debulking because you don't get much of a window. Because once you 
cut with an electro battery and if it is going to bleed, you want to go inside but your anesthetist says that the saturation is falling. So that is when the real dispute comes between you and anesthetist because you know that the patient is desaturating because of the bleeding. But the anesthetist feels that as long as he doesn't ventilate, you cannot go inside. So you need to take your anesthetist into confidence and that is the only thing. But generally most of the central airway obstructions, whatever we have dealt till now, we never had a problem with the ventilation or an oxygenation prior and until and unless they had an underlying lung disease. Vishwesh, I just wanted to ask you one thing. I mean, the last case that you mentioned, patient came with a massive pericardial effusion. Did you drain the effusion before taking it on? Yeah, the effusion was drained. Actually, the effusion was also sent for uh, analysis. Even the cell block in the pericardial came negative. Probably it was a transudative one. So that is when the, and the female was very young and the pericardial effusion analysis was negative. And the pre-suspicion was more for a tuberculosis because the presentation was more in the form of a fibrosing media stimulus. So, though we had a differential of uh, malignancy, our primary differentials are either tuberculosis or fungal. That is when uh, we went for the EBUS. So, once we did the EBUS and we understood it as a malignant, then we thought that we will do a palliative procedure. But I wouldn't say that if I have to go in retrospect and do the same procedure, maybe I would not go for a stint. So that is a realization which we made. Anyway, that patient got extubated on table. She was doing very good. But only complication we ended up was patient developing an SVC syndrome. So she had an SVC, but the SVC had worsened following the voice and placement, for which again we need to give a radiation therapy. And end of the day, all these procedures were more of a palliative form. She was feeling much better from a breathlessness point of view, but she had a cosmetic deformity and a headache because of the SVC syndrome. Okay, uh, I, I think that's a yeah. Rajiv. Go ahead, I'll pass. Yeah, so uh, Jay, if I can make a couple of comments. Uh, nice uh, presentation. Uh, one thing that I think when we deal with central area obstruction, we need to keep in mind is that you must always be very sure about what is there distal to the obstruction. Because unless you do that, you may get into a problem. So I think uh, in all such cases, a very careful evaluation of the CT and your initial kind of uh, bronchoscopic evaluation should ensure that uh, you know your tumor is not too large before you start actually addressing or trying to debulk it. And you should have patent airways at the other end because if the airway beyond your tumor is not patent and this would be especially true when you are dealing with uh, tumors in the main bronchi. You know, tracheal tumors you can make out that, okay, the patient is living because he has, you know, a patency beyond the tumor. But uh, in the airways, especially I would say on the left side, it is becomes even more challenging. Uh, you need to be very, very sure that, uh, you know, you have distal patency. Because there is no point in trying to debulk a tumor where you are not going to have distal patency. In that context, you know, some of these uh, benign tumors, uh, for example, a long-standing carcinoid. Now, if that carcinoid has, you know, blocked the left lung and that lung line is lying collapsed, you know, for, uh, you know, any length of time, then beyond a point that lung is not salvageable. So, you know, there is no point in trying to do an intervention for such a case. And, uh, you know, Atul Mehta actually talked of the rule of four. So, you know, there he says that a tumor more than 4 centimeters uh, is better, you know, kind of uh, addressed differently and don't try to do bronchoscopic interventions for very large tumors. So, that is a point I wanted to make that when you are dealing with these central airway obstructions, uh, you need to keep in mind. And if you then, if on your bronchoscopy, if you find that the distal airway is patent, then the initial bronchoscopy also helps because you may be able to suck out all the mucus and the pus which is there distally. And when you actually debunk the tumor, it helps because that lung then starts to ventilate. Because sometimes, you know, if like the large first case that you showed, very large tumor on the right side. Now you debunk that tumor and I was very happy to see that you put a blocker on the left side to protect it. Because if you don't do that and this tumor after cutting migrates to the left, and gets impacted there and it may sometimes be a little challenging to take it out then you may have a situation where you can't ventilate the patient because the right lung was previously already collapsed and the left lung has you know become now uh, impacted with a tumor which you can't remove very easily 
you, you know, it can give you very anxious moments. So uh, you have to keep these things in mind and I think that for all these airway procedures, careful planning prior to the procedure and you know, I was sitting with Jaya last night and we were discussing this that you know, careful planning and running you know, 10 different ways and how you are going to address all those plan A, B, C, uh, you know, how you are going to manage that, that really helps. So I think uh, very nicely you have shown, you know, nice four cases and uh, uh, I'm sure everybody has benefited from that. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's a whole lot of experience talking. Yes. You, you made a valid point that uh, patients with COPD or RTML and this is can have uh, symptom given small tumor. And uh, uh, how you are going to decide uh, uh, whether I am going to give bulk or not in this patient, particularly when a patient comes with a COPD and symptom of dyspnea, so that this dyspnea is due to this uh, tumor or uh, uh, COPD. So the only way we will come to know is what was the status prior from the history. Like if he, if he says like within a span of one month his dyspnea has worsened so much that it's, it, it is incapacitating his daily day to day function and you don't find an alternative cause of dyspnea then you are pretty sure that probably this tumour is what is compromising this uh, underlying lung condition. Another thing is in such patients also if they are going to have a refractory cuff that is not subsiding or this is causing a lot of hemopsis then we would still go for a tumour debulking but I need to no, from Rajivul sir and Kaichana sir, whether that would be an adequate criteria. But I think the only their past history can give you some idea of a patient who was doing pretty fine with a grade 2 dyspnea, suddenly all of 10 days to 15 days develops a grade 4 dyspnea. You don't have any other thing to attribute this dyspnea to, then probably that dyspnea is because of the tumour which is causing a more compromising of its underlying lung condition. Yeah, if I might just add to that. Say coexisting COPD and a central airway tumor. Optimize the treatment for COPD, and we know that we need to intervene in the central airway obstruction in any case, with or without COPD. So, ideally, go and uh, optimize the treatment for COPD. Go ahead and address the central airway issue there. It is impossible to make out how much is which problem is contributing to what extent. It's impossible to make out. But a potentially uh, dangerous obstruction in the central airway needs to be dealt with. How it is dealt with? Well, it all depends on you know what is really causing all that. Okay, extrinsic, intra, I mean, intraluminal. All these things have to be considered before you address it, that particular issue independently. Uh, in the third is that fibrosing media is uh, would have. Uh, Pre-procedure radiotherapy or chemotherapy? We never, uh, that's what in retrospect, yes, we could have been, but I don't think even that would have changed any of the management because the primary indication why we had, we went for a wise stenting is because she was having a dyspnea which was MMRC grade 4 despite tapping out all the pericardial fluid. So we, and she was having audible V's and she was coughing out profusely. But we were able to give her symptom relief in these things like her, she was extubated on table, she was off uh, uh, ventilator on table, her cuff has decreased, her uh, dyspnea decreased, but yes, we landed up with other complications, her SVC wasn't. So, retrospect, uh, did we achieve anything great? Definitely not. But what primary objective with which we went inside, we were able to achieve it. But we should have, we could have, we should have anticipated the SVC to worsen which was an experience for us. Uh, if I may add to this, your question about taking up these cases post radiotherapy. If you have seen a trachea or a tracheobronchial tree, after a patient has gone through radiation therapy, you will not go there with a the rigid at all. The tissues are so friable, you go there and you will tear the trachea surely. So after radiation, even if somebody asks you to do something, do any procedure, avoid it like the plague. You are going to get into, get yourself into a lot of trouble post radiotherapy. I am not talking about single high dose shot given there to reduce the bulk of the tumor and other things. But anybody who has gone through a conventional radiotherapy, if you have to intervene, avoid it as much as you can. The tissues are very, very, very fragile. 
Uh, thank you. So we have the next talk by our expert speaker, Dr. Rajiv Gayal, sir, uh, and sir will be speaking on stand, and uh, Jaychand, Dr. Jaychandra, and Dr. Vinay will moderate the session.